So this video is going to look at the neural and hormonal explanations of aggression. So this is going to focus on the biological sort of aspect of the causes of human aggression. Now within neural, that refers to the limbic system and serotonin. So that's things to do with brain structures and neurotransmitters. And in terms of hormones, we're going to be focusing on testosterone mainly. Okay. So if we're going to look at the limbic system, which is an area of the brain, this fits under the umbrella term of neural um, explanation. So it's um, the primitive part of the brain and it's located on top of the brain stem and just underneath the cortex. Now it is seen as the structures that are evolved in our emotion and survival emotions in particular, so fear and anger, so aggression would fit under that kind of um, remit. So the amygdala is an area that is meant to be involved in those emotional responses and linked to the cause of human aggression. So it has been found that stimulation of the amygdala results in an increased aggressive behaviour and damage to that area reduces levels of aggression. So research has suggested that surgical removal um, within an animal resulted in longer response to a um, stimulus that would have previously led to rage and aggressive behaviour. So it's showing that removal of that um, area didn't necessarily result in aggression. So if that indicates that that area is responsible for the aggressive response and aggressive behaviour. Equally, we have the hippocampus that is meant to be involved in the formation of long-term memories and it allows animals to respond to a threat in a similar way that they would have done in a past um, experience. Again, research has suggested that impairment to this area um, cause them to respond inappropriately to a sensory stimulus and resulted in aggressive behaviour. So this is implying that these two areas within the limbic system are a cause of human aggression. So if we to look at some AO3 then we have supporting evidence. So MRI scans showed that those um, individuals with lower amygdala volumes displayed um, higher levels of aggression and violence. So that was a study of 56 males who had varying histories of violence and therefore it suggests the amygdala does play a key role in aggression in humans. Equally we have um, other supporting evidence that found that hippocampus in right and left hemispheres were different in size in convicted violent criminals. So it implies that the asymmetry in the hippocampal region is linked to aggressive behaviour. Um, so it could be that those um, asymmetries impair the hippocampus from functioning as it normally would and that is why they are being aggressive. So we've got, again we've got that supporting evidence. However an issue with the neural explanation is that it is biologically reductionist. It reduces human aggression down to a, uh, a certain brain region, so the limbic system and therefore it is ignoring the role of cognition and environmental factors that could be linked to aggression. So if you think about of factors that could be linked to aggression um, from the environment, so social learning theory, de-individuation, it's completely ignoring those. So does it offer a complete explanation or is it being really reductionist and not allowing us to provide a whole explanation of human aggression? So again, within um, the neural explanation, we have the role of neurotransmitters. So serotonin is a neurotransmitter that regulates mood within the body. And low levels of serotonin have been associated with aggressive behavior. So this is because serotonin in normal levels has a calming effect on the brain. And that is associated with self-control. So therefore, low levels of serotonin, decreased levels of serotonin 
have been shown to have um, an effect of being less in control and increasing that aggressive, impulsive, violent behaviour. So it was found that drugs that lower levels of serotonin were associated and linked with increases in aggression in men, but not in women. So we've got the idea that it does appear to have some role in human aggression. So again, we have supporting evidence. So it was found that a meta-analysis of 175 studies found a link between serotonin levels and human aggression. Um, equally, other research has found that when lower levels of serotonin were, um, were reduced, it was linked to aggression in monkeys and dogs. So we have supporting evidence that if you want to take that a step further, you could have your counterpoint or an issue surrounding meta-analysis. So obviously they are they are problematic because um, they only have access to research that has been published and there might be publication bias. So remember when we talked about peer review, generally it's only research that finds a significant outcome gets published or research that goes along with the status quo that gets published. So there could be issues surrounding um, the validity of research that Duke was able to analyse for his study. Equally, there could be some extrapolation issues. Um, monkeys and dogs, although there might be some biological similarities, it's likely that humans are more complex in their violent behaviour and aggressive behaviour. So should we be cautious when extrapolating the findings from um, non-human animals to humans. Equally, again, we come down to this idea that it's highly reductionist, it's biologically reductionist, um, it's ignoring any environmental factors such as de-individuation, social learning theory, um, and frustration aggression hypothesis. So it might not offer a complete explanation of human aggression. Equally, it can't explain any cultural differences, and there are cultural differences in aggressive rates. If it was biological, we'd expect um, aggression to be consistent and universal across all cultures. However, the Kunsang of the Kalahari Desert, Desert are a tribe that are non-violent and non-aggressive because they see it as it leading to irreparable damage to the aggressor so therefore this reduces the validity because if it was down to neural explanations you would expect it to be universal but it isn't so this theory could be culturally biased and um, it's ignoring any cultural differences so if we were to look at some exam style question um, you could get outline and evaluate the role of neural mechanisms in aggression, so an 8 marker. So remember, an 8 marker is um, split, although it's marked holistically, 3 marks for your AO1, two marks, um, 5 marks for your AO3. So I would do one AO1 paragraph and then two evaluation points. Now, this is going to have to be a breadth and depth trade-off. So for an eight marker, I would, I personally would outline one of the neural mechanisms. So I would either outline limbic system or serotonin and then evaluate those. You could do limbic system and serotonin, but for an eight marker, that would probably be too much information and you would waste time in this um, area. So I would go down one of those routes. So if we were to move on to hormonal explanations, we're going to focus on testosterone. So testosterone is an androgen, so it's characterized characterized as sort of a male hormone, and it's produced by the, the Leydig cells via the pituitary and adrenal glands, and it binds to androgen receptors um, within the neural circuit within the, the brain. And there seems to be a link between high levels of testosterone and increased aggression levels. So it acts on brain areas that are involved in controlling aggression and research has suggested that by removing the source of testosterone it led to reduced levels of aggression. However, when they returned those um, 
testosterone levels back to normal, aggression returned. So this does seem to suggest that aggression and testosterone are linked together. Now, the basal model of testosterone suggests the more testosterone an individual has, the more dominant and aggressive they become. Therefore, a male with high levels of testosterone will take part in antisocial behaviour such as fighting and be more aggressive and violent and on the whole be more dominating and domineering. So this is the indicator that testosterone is linked to human aggression. So again, if we were to look at some evaluation points, so we have supporting evidence. So um, research has measured the sal um, saliva testosterone in violent and non-violent criminals and found that those with the highest testosterone levels had a history of violent crime, whereas those who had low levels of testosterone had uh, committed um, non-violent crimes. So this is supporting the idea that high levels of testosterone is linked to aggressive acts. However, we have some contradictory evidence. So some research has found no correlation between testosterone and violence in male prisoners. So that suggests that the link between testosterone and aggression might be more complex than first assumed. Equally, this area is guilty of being gender biased. Most of the studies have been um, tested on male subjects because it's easier to measure uh, testosterone levels in males than it is in females. So therefore, hormonal explanations of aggression could be considered to be alpha bias. It could be exaggerating differences between men and women in terms of aggression. So the idea that males will be more aggressive than females because they have higher levels of testosterone. Equally, is this taking into account all types of aggression? Are we measuring physical aggression as opposed to non-physical aggression? So some research seems to suggest that males will engage in more physical acts of aggression, whereas females will be more passive in their aggression. So they might be more verbally aggressive, um, spreading rumours about a person, gossiping. Equally, they might ostracise other females from a group. So men might be more active in their aggression due to testosterone, but women could be more passive. So this um, whole um, idea of high levels of testosterone could be guilty of being gender biased. So if we were to look at a 16 marker then, um, previous um, exam papers have been discussed the role of neural and or hormonal mechanisms in aggression. So remember the word discuss means outline and evaluate. Now this type of um, question when it says and or means you can just go down the route of talking about neural explanations for 16 marks or hormonal mechanisms for 16 marks or you can do a combination of the both of them. So you might find it easier to do an A01 paragraph on serotonin levels and then evaluate it and then an A01 paragraph on testosterone and evaluate it. Equally, you could go down the route of doing two um, paragraphs on testosterone levels and evaluate those. So it's up to you how you would do so, but remember for a 16 mark, you need to have two A01 paragraphs and then three Peel paragraphs, maybe four if you um, have time. If you can include some issues and debates, such as it being gender bias, might have cultural differences, um, being reductionist, then you were showing the examiner that you can be synoptic in bringing those issues and debates 